Order. Order. Questions to the Secretary of State for Defence, Mr Peter Aldous. Question number one, please, Mr Speaker. The Secretary of State for Defence, Secretary Gavin Williams. With permission, Mr Speaker, I'd like to answer questions one and 21 together. The Royal Navy plays a crucial role in patrolling the seas around the United Kingdom. As we leave the European Union, the needs and level of activity will change and will work with other departments to assess what is required. The Royal Navy will continue to play a vital role in protecting UK waters. Peter Aldous. Thank you, Thank you Mr Speaker. I am grateful to the Secretary of State for that answer. With fisheries protection being an important component part of a sustainable UK fishing policy post-Brexit, has the Secretary of State actually liaised with his counterpart in DEFRA as to what funds will be available to the Royal Navy, fisheries protection and whether the number of, days of, of, a number of operational days will be increased? Secretary of State. Uh, the Department has been in receipt of extra money from the Treasury of £12 million, which we have actually prioritised for this area, and we are in dialogue with our colleagues at the Department for Environment, Food and Re- Rural Affairs to ensure that we actually have the right level of policing and the right level of support in our territorial waters. Uh, the Royal Navy is absolutely committed to delivering this, and we will work with our colleagues in DEFRA to ensure it happens. Scott Mann. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Could I ask the Secretary of State whether he would consider basing the Type 26 and Type 31E frigates in Devonport to protect Cornwall and Devon uh, and support our great IFCA teams uh, who protect the waters currently? Could you stay? Well, I, I know that my honourable friend is a great champion of a fisherman of the North Cornwall coast, and I imagine that the deployment of uh, type 26 frigates would certainly uh, see the French and the Spanish off uh, very swiftly. Um, uh, he'll be pleased to know that Plymouth will be receiving an extra Type 23 frigate uh, very shortly, which will be based in Plymouth Devonport. And while I'm sure she'll do some fishery protection uh, work, she will also be ensuring she does other work right around the globe as well. Mr Martin Doherty Hughes. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Concerning the Royal Navy, those on these benches are most interested to hear of the modernising defence programme where it will be grounded in vacuous global Britain speak of the bozo Brexiteers, or will it actually acknowledge the UK's geostrategic location? Therefore, can the Secretary of State assure these benches that unlike 2010 and 2012 S- 2015 SDRs, SDSRs, the modernising defence programme will explicitly mention the North Atlantic and the High North and their centrality to the assumptions made therein. And fisheries. <laughs> well done. <laughs> Secretary of State. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I will mention fisheries, the High North and everything else, as I am sure the Honourable Member would love to see mentioned in it. Uh, Mr Richard Benyon. Uh, the Fisheries Protection Squadron is the oldest established unit in the Royal Navy. But as a possible help to my right honourable friend, Would you not agree that uh, technology is moving on, a combination of data analytics, of satellite imaging, and the kind of protection measures we are now able to deploy around, for example, the Pitcairn Islands uh, uh, Marine Protection Area, are the sort of technologies that we can add to save him cost? Secretary of State. Uh, the right on, my right on my friend is absolutely right. We do need to be looking at new technologies to assist uh, the Royal Navy in the work that they do. Uh, it is a, a very large ocean and there is an awful lot of threats in terms of making sure that it is properly policed. So we need to embrace that new technology, uh, working hand in hand with the Royal Navy to make sure our waters are safe from foreign fishermen intruding into our territory. Oh, very well. Martin Vickers. Thank you, uh, Mr Speaker. I'm encouraged by what I hear from the Secretary of State about the extra resources being made available. But in a post-Brexit world, of course, we anticipate an increase in the uh, fishing fleet. Can he give an assurance that the fisheries protection fleet will expand accordingly? Secretary of State. Well, what we're going to be doing is looking at actually what capability do we do need for our fisheries protection fleet. Uh, We actually have three offshore patrol vessels currently uh, engaged in this work, and we'll be looking to see if that is something that needs to expand and how that can be properly funded. Uh, Mr Jim Cunningham. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. Question two. (coughs) Minister Gito Beb. 
Uh, with permission, Mr Speaker, I should like to answer question 2 and 22 together. Uh, we are taking steps to ensure strategic affordability through the Modernising Defence Programme and our annual financial management processes. The cost of the plan is reviewed on an ongoing basis, and we expect to publish the Equipment Plan Financial Summary for 2018-2028 in the autumn. Jim Cunningham. Could the Minister confirm that the Government still intends to procure the full 138F35 as previously announced? Well, I thank the Honourable Gentleman for Minister. his question. Uh, he gave me great pleasure to be present at RAF Maham on Wednesday to welcome the first four, and as he is aware, the first 48 are fully paid for and committed to. We are looking at everything in terms of the modernised defence programme, but the current situation is that we are still anticipating the purchase of 138 F-35. Mr. Speaker, the Public Accounts Committee said in a recent report that, and I quote, the equipment plan for 2017 to 2027 is not realistic and the department lacks cost control. Does the Secretary of State share my deep concern about his department's equipment budget being in such an appalling state? Minister. Well, I'm sure the Secretary of State shares my view, which is that the Public Accounts Committee does an important job. However, it is important to state that the assumptions made in the National Audit Office reports, which underpinned the report of the Public Accounts Committee, highlighted the possibility that every single project would end up with no efficiency savings and the worst case scenario being achieved in terms of cost controls. So we are very confident that we do have an equipment plan which is affordable, but as I have already stated, we are looking at all issues as part of our modernising defence programme. And Mr Philip Ollivan. How many drones are we going to have with the RAF, the Royal Navy and uh, the Army by 2027, both for reconnaissance and for taking out uh, our enemies? Minister, I am happy to concede that the honourable, my honourable friend has caught me on the hop on this one. Uh, I am not able to give him a specific answer at this point in time, but I am sure that the honourable member would allow me to write to him and confirm those figures in due course. Mr. Bill Grant, Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Can the minister confirm that the Type 26 frigates are being built within budget and are continue to provide jobs for the Scottish workforce for years to come? Minister. Well, I can confirm that the Type 26 project is going extremely well. Uh, the first blocks have been built, steel has been cut, the first three ships have been named. And I think the really important point about the Type 26 project, which was highlighted in the recent Westminster Hall debate, is the fact that the, that the apprenticeships, apprentices who will be working on this project, the last ones have not yet been born. That is the long term commitment to shipbuilding on the Clyde, which the Type 26 project represents. Mr. Kevin Jones. The NEO uh, estimated that there's a shortfall in the equipment budget of £9.6 billion. £1.3 billion of that is for the ty new Type. Uh, 31E frigate. Uh, can he assure the House that today, that in the autumn, that uh, budget line for the Type 31 will actually be included? Minister. The situation from uh, the point of view of the Type 31 is that the procurement is going extremely well. Uh, it is currently on target, and our expectation is that the £1.25 billion budget for five Type 31 frigates will be achieved. Andrew Bowie. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Does my honourable friend not agree that the arrival of the F 35s on British shores is a signal to the world that uh, global Britain is not just empty rhetoric, as some would have us believe, but actually yeah. now a demonstrable fact? Yeah. Minister. Well, I can, I can agree with my honourable friend that uh, it, it is a statement of our aspiration moving forward, but I think it is also a, a significant uh, statement in terms of the contribution of defence to our national prosperity. 3,500 F 35s will be procured worldwide, 15% of them will be prepared produced here in the United Kingdom, equivalent to 525 platforms. That is a significant vote of confidence in UK industry. Mr. Speaker, can, can the Minister confirm to the House the details of a letter that he sent to me that the fleet support vessels will be bound by the EU rules on state aid? Minister. The situation is as per the shipbuilding strategy and as per the letter I sent, which is that we are currently looking to procure the fleet solid support, ship, support ships. Uh, the shipbuilding strategy aims to ensure that we have a strong shipbuilding sector moving forward. That strong sector also needs a degree of competition. We are protecting uh, warships as a national capability, but we are opening other elements of the shipbuilding strategy to international competition. Andrew Bridgen. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Does the Minister agree with me that keeping our armed forces equipped to the very highest standard, well led and with a strong fighting spirit, is the best deterrent our country has? Yeah. Minister. Well, I couldn't agree more with my honourable friend. Uh, Wayne David. Yeah. Not affordable, not realistic, not complete, 
unbalanced and unmanageable. These are some of the politer things which have been said about the government's equipment plan. These comments have not been made by the government's political opponents, but by the Public Accounts Committee and the National Audit Office. Not since the end of the Second World War has there been such devastating criticisms of the government's defence programme. This £20.8 billion black hole in the MOD's equipment plan has come through this government's shameful incompetence. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How does the government intend to, to get out of this mess, and can we look forward to extra resources from a modernising defence programme? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, at a risk of repeating myself, Mr Speaker, I think the National Auditor's Office and the Public Accounts Committee do an important work for this, for this House, but it should also be highlighted, and I have said it once, but I'll say it again, the figures quoted in the National Auditor's Office reports were a worst-case scenario. They were looking at every single project hitting the worst-case scenario. They were looking at no efficiencies whatsoever being created, being created within the programme. We are looking at all these issues as part of a modernising defence programme, but I would genuinely say to the honourable gentleman that he should read the report with a bit more care and understand it. Number three, please, Mr. Speaker. Minister Mark Lancaster. The MOD takes cyber threats very seriously, and we regularly assess our ability to, f- to defend against them. We are strengthening our defences against increasingly sophisticated attacks through a wide range of technical, operational and administrative measures, including close cooperation with the National Cyber Security Centre. The Minister, for that answer, can the Minister clarify how much the Government intends to spend during the course of this Parliament to improve UK cyber security? Well, I'm Minister, for the question. it gives me the opportunity to highlight that we have and continue to invest defence's cyber capabilities, including the opening of the Defence Cyber School in March, a £40 million investment for a new cyber security operations capability, and £265 million towards a new cyber vulnerability investigation programme. Now, Mrs. Madeline Moon. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The further east you go, the greater the awareness of the cyber threat. Mm-hmm in individual countries. Lithuania, Estonia, Poland and Sweden have all published publications advising people how to deal with the cyber threat. What does this government intend to do to build resilience among the British public in understanding both the botnets, the hacktivists, all of the ways in which Russia is attacking our political and our social institutions? Well, I think we're well on our way. I mean, the 2015 National Security Strategy reaffirmed cyber as a top tier one risk, and that's precisely why uh, we opened the National Cyber Security Centre, which helps to coordinate the work of government and indeed the private sector, and also why we now consider uh, from our armed forces core skills cyber to be absolutely essential. Mary Cray. There's astonishing complacency in his reply. We know that cyber attacks are a key plank in Russia's hybrid warfare, where fake news, Twitter bots and even ambassadors are used to create confusion. For example, about the findings of the investigation into MH17. What is he taking, what steps is he taking to educate the British public about the way that Russia is systematically using our open, democratic, free society to weaken the European Union and return to a Europe of nation states controlled by spheres of influence? Well, I am frankly staggered that the Honourable Lady thinks that £1.9 billion worth of investment is somehow complacency from this government. I've already outlined exactly how Defence is investing in cyber. We also, in case she hasn't visited, it would be interesting to see if she has the National Cyber Security Centre, which is only a mile down the road. So if she hasn't been, perhaps she should go and have a look for herself what the government is doing to respond to her request. Uh, Mr Barry Chairman. Question number four, Mr Speaker. I met with NATO defence ministers last week to discuss progress towards next month's summit. The UK wants NATO to strengthen its deterrence and defence capabilities while ensuring dialogue with Russia continues as part of the Alliance's commitment to avoiding misunderstanding and miscalculation. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Speaker, I tabled this question before the disastrous consequences of G- the, the, the failure of the G7 uh, in uh, Canada. Um, d- isn't, isn't it seemingly uh, uh, like this country's back in 1939, isolated from Europe, mm. with NATO under, uh, uh, under threat, uh, a big gulf between our traditional United States and ally? What's he going to do about it? Well, in, in my discussions with the 
US Defence Secretary. He is absolutely clear about the United States' commitment to NATO and European defence. And let us not underestimate how supportive they have been of NATO and their commitment over the next couple of years to pump both resources, troops and money into ensuring that our defence is the very best that we can possibly have. Mr Speaker, NATO is quite rightly um, concentrating on the Russian threat to the east and to the southeast of Europe, and that's quite correct. But what more can we do to encourage them to take an interest in the high north and the Arctic, where the Russians have recently built eight new military bases at enormous cost. They have a huge submarine activity uh, coming out into the North Atlantic, and they've reinvented the old bastion concept left over from the Cold War. Sure, there's a huge threat there, and NATO has to do something about it. Stay. Well, we have seen a considerable increase in Russian activity in the High North, as we've seen an increase in our activity in the High North as well, with HMS Trenchant taking part in ISEX, and also the announcement of the additional uh, astute class submarine HMS Agincourt. Uh, This is all about how we're investing to keep ourselves safe and also the North Atlantic free from threats going forward. Mr McGovern. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Further airstrikes in Syria on Friday have seen civilians dead and injured. What conversations has he had with our NATO colleagues about how we can make sure that Russia upholds international humanitarian law? Well, Syria is yet another of those areas of conflict that you see Russia being so heavily involved. Uh, We have been working with uh, the SDF to make sure that we give them the right level of support that they need, and we will continue to have a dialogue with our allies to do everything we can do to bring a peaceful solution to Syria. We do need to have a diplomatic dialogue, and Russia has to step up to the plate. It has to recognise that it needs to put pressure on the Assad regime to stop the dreadful, atrocious actions that are continuing to be, continuing to be done on the Syrian people, and this has to be brought to an end. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Could the Secretary of State confirm the role that Romania is playing in tackling the Russian threat, and what resources the UK is putting into Romania? Uh, We have been working very closely with Romania, with Royal Marines working very closely with Romanian Defence Forces, but more recently the Royal Air Force being deployed in Romania to deliver air policing over that country and its neighbours. And we've seen as a result of that a significant drop-off in the number of Russian incursions as a result of the RAF support. Stuart Malcolm (laughs) MacDonald. Mr Speaker, just a couple of weeks ago, myself and SNP colleagues returned from the Ukrainian town of Avdivka, just two miles from the contact line of that conflict, and we witnessed firsthand what Russian aggression really looks like against civilians. Yet, at the weekend, President Trump made the astonishing claim that President Obama was to blame for the illegal invasion of Crimea. Can he just set the record straight that this government does not hold that view and that Russia is to blame for the illegal invasion of Crimea? Um, Russia is solely to blame for the illegal invasion of Ukraine and uh, the activities that have occurred there. Yeah, Malcolm Donald. Extremely grateful for that answer from the State Secretary. Thinking of national security in the broadest context and Russian influence, of course we learned about revelations at the weekend concerning Russian influence operations as far as UK electoral contests go, showing that their operations are as widespread as they are pernicious. Can he tell the House what action he is taking in government and with NATO allies to crack down on Russian money flowing through London, the reform of Scottish limited partnerships? And does he agree that it is not only in our interest, but in the collective interest with our partners, including Ukraine? The Honourable General has completed his disquisition, and we are deeply grateful to him for doing so. Secretary of State. Thank you, Mr Speaker. A number of the areas that the Honourable Member touched on was probably more, be more suitable for Treasury questions, but we continue to work with our allies to make sure everything that we can do is actually done and implemented to stop the flow of Russian money into uh, our country and to others. Question number five, Mr Speaker. Yeah. Minister Bebb. 
Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, we are committed to supporting a thriving and internationally competitive defence sector. We published our national shipbuilding strategy, refreshed our defence industrial policy, and are developing a combat air strategy. In March, the defence secretary announced he had invited the honourable member for Ludlow to conduct a review into the defence contribution to prosperity, and I look forward to the publication of this report shortly. My Gamesbury. The fleet solid support ship contracts have the potential to bring jobs and work to shipyards across the UK. Does the Minister not agree that these ships should be built in Britain and will make this competition a UK only one? Yeah. Minister Babb! Well, I have consistently argued that the shipbuilding strategy, the national shipbuilding strategy, should be supported across this chamber. I believe that that shipbuilding strategy offers real support for our shipbuilding industry. We designate warships to be a sovereign capability to be built in the UK. Other ships are open to international competition, and I am confident that there will be British yards putting in bids for that work. Thank you. Mr Speaker, uh, when considering replacement for the RAF's AWACS fleet, will the Minister commit to holding an open competition so that bids from all defence partners, UK as well as abroad, can be considered? And will he also consider whether Sentry and Sentinel may in future be replaced with one aircraft type? Well, I thank my honourable gen- uh, the honourable friend for his question. Uh, uh, and he is well known for his uh, championing of the RAF and issues to do with the Air Force. I think it is important to say that we are currently in the MOD going through a process of considering the replacements for that case. Capability, and we are also considering the situation in terms of Sentinel moving forward. And a decision will be made in due course, and the honourable gentleman will be informed at that point. Frank Field. When the Minister sits down after this series of questions, would you remind the Secretary of State, who is not listening, that he's, that he's, that he's actually been to a number of yards that will compete with Camel Lairds and not Camel Lairds, and when he's actually deciding the shipbuilding programme, he needs to be seen to be fair, as well as awarding us orders. Minister. I thank the right hon. Gentleman for his question. I think the process will be seen to be fair because the process will be fair. Uh, this is a real commitment that we are providing to the shipbuilding sector. We are absolutely committed to the shipbuilding sector. We have adopted the shipbuilding strategy, and I hope that the hon. Gentleman will have confidence in the process. Ford. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Engineers in Great Baddow in Chelmsford have been designing world-class radar systems for generations. Will the Minister take into account local skills and jobs when awarding the next contract to make sure that British capabilities are not compromised? Minister. Well, I thank the, my honourable friend for her question, and I think it is an important point that she's making in terms of taking into account all the contribution made to our economy when a contract is awarded. And I think my honourable friend will be very interested in, for example, the new Treasury Green Book and also some of the conclusions made by the honourable member for Ludlow in his reports on prosperity. Stephen Doughty. Question number six, Mr. Speaker. E. Minister Lancaster. No decisions have been taken on sending additional UK troops to Afghanistan. The UK makes an important contribution to the non-combat NATO mission in Afghanistan, where our troop uh, commitment is kept under regular review to ensure it remains suited to the needs of the mission. Uh, Mr Speaker, the Minister will be aware that just today 12 civilians have been killed in a suicide bombing attack outside a ministry in Kabul, including women and children, and this is a part of a string of attacks that have happened despite ceasefire efforts uh, by President Ghani. Uh, would he agree with me that we very much need to protect the, um, the gains that we made um, at the expense of blood and treasure in Afghanistan over many, many years, um, and will he consider looking at the situation and whether we need to provide more support to the Afghan security forces? Minister. The Honourable Gentleman makes um, a very reasonable point, and he will understand, as somebody who spent uh, my own time in Afghanistan in 2006, that's a subject very close to my heart, and I'm determined that we should not indeed, as he says, uh, lose that blood and treasure. Uh, indeed, this is an issue which I raised with Dr Abdullah Abdullah, the Chief Executive of Afghanistan, when I met him on uh, well, last week, last Thursday, uh, and we will look at this matter very carefully to see what further support we can offer. Andrew Slaughter. You, Mr. Speaker. Uh, the Secretary of State has made a welcome concession on the issue of Afghan interpreters. It may be a uh, small comfort to those of us with constituency cases if it was reported only 50 uh, interpreters plus their dependents will be allowed to come in addition to the UK. Will instead uh, the government look at the the, the whole issue and the process of assessing interpreters and look at every case again because there are some very deserving cases out. 
Minister. The Honourable Gentleman may be aware that um, I actually chair a, a committee, uh, a joint committee with the House of Lords on this issue, where we do indeed go through that process very carefully. And on a quarterly basis, we do actually pluck out individual cases and review them for that very reason. Alex Bell. Minister. <laughs> Very good to see the Minister. I was in the Honourable Gentleman's constituency on Friday speaking to school students and they spoke of him with great warmth and affection. Minister. <laughs> Mr Speaker, I, I didn't see the letter, but I'm sure it's on its way, sir. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure I told the Honourable Gentleman, but if I didn't do so, I'm the first to apologise. Pretty sure I did. But anyway, it was a great joy. On, on reflection, I think I did receive some message that you were heading there. <laughs> Mr Speaker, we can be extremely proud of our armed forces, but if we are to continue to recruit the brightest and the best, we must continue to invest in our equipment and indeed our training, but also the welfare of our people. So I am very pleased that we are moving forward with a future accommodation model. This will give three choices to our armed forces personnel, either to remain on the garrison in the unit inside the wire or to step outside and rent in the accommodation, or thirdly, to get on the housing ladder and purchase property. Alex Sobel. Uh, Russi criticised the future accommodation model and said that it was woefully inadequate and behind schedule. Will the super garrison at Catterick be finished on time to ensure for armed forces personnel can live on garrison? And does he think that the sale to Annington Homes in 1996 was a mistake? <laughs> Minister. Um, with uh, due respect to the Honourable Gentleman, I think he's mixing a number of issues here. The future accommodation model has yet to actually start. It's due to the pilot scheme will start in uh, December, and that is on track. We have been working very close with the Families Federations, and they're the ones that have re recommended the locations for the pilot scheme. So I'm very much looking forward to this uh, taking place in December. Edward Arga. Thank you, sir. Recently, some concerns have been expressed to me about the quality of grounds and buildings maintenance at armed forces accommodation at Woodhouse in my constituency. The Minister's commitment to our armed forces personnel is well known and very clear. Can he reassure me that the future accommodation model will include high quality maintenance and will he meet me to discuss this specific issue? Minister. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, the accommodation is very, very important. As I mentioned, equipment and training is one thing, but we must make sure that we look after our people. And one of the reasons why armed forces personnel choose to leave is because of the uh, levels of accommodation, and that's why we're investing in more modern accommodation. I'd be delighted to meet with my old friend. This is something that the Secretary of State and myself take very, very seriously to upgrade the accommodation we offer our armed forces personnel. Christian Matheson. Question number yeah, eight. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I do beg the honourable. I do beg the honourable gentleman's pardon. Uh, it's very courteous of him sitting there quietly, but he actually wanted to come in on this question. <laughs> Have a go, ma'am. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, the affordability of the future accommodation model relies heavily on the present rent adjustment on the Annington Homes estate, but this is due, as we know, to be renegotiated for 2021, with expectations that this will rise, that rents will rise significantly. The Tories were warned about this in 1996, that the sell-off of married quarters was a mistake, and this is exactly what has transpired. So what urgent steps is the Minister taking and the Department taking to ensure that the rent renegotiation does not further cripple the MOD budget? Uh, he raises a number of matters there again, and I agree with him that perhaps there is a question mark over what happened in the past, but it has happened in the past, and we need to move forward to provide the necessary offering for our armed forces uh, personnel. As I mentioned, we are working with the families of federations to make sure that we get the necessary deal, which is affordable for our troops. Matheson. Number eight, sir. Mr. Baird. The Ministry of Defence is working closely with other government departments, the UK aerospace sector, uh, academia and international partners to explore the UK's future uh, approach to combat air capabilities. We intend to publish the initial findings this summer. Uh, Christian Matheson. Mr. Speaker, we have a world leading aerospace sector, but we can't de deliver the combat air strategy on our own. So, in terms of future collaboration, where does the Minister expect most of that to be? With Europe or with the United States? 
Well, I thank uh, the uh, gentleman for his question. I think it's fair to say that the reason why we're undertaking a combat air strategy is because the UK are global uh, leaders in this field. Uh, the export capabilities, for example, of UK industry in terms of, of combat air is well known, £6 billion last year worth of exports. So the partnerships that we're approaching are across the globe. We have written as a department to partners uh, in the US and also across Europe and further afield. Bambos Chanalambos. Uh, number nine, Mr. Speaker. Minister. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, with permission, Mr. Speaker, I should like to answer questions 9, 14, and 19 together. Uh, the Ministry of Defence is working closely with our defence industry to understand the implications and opportunities presented by the UK's departure from the European Union. We want to explore how our industries can continue working together, but it is worth noting that current collaborative cap uh, capability projects, such as Typhoon, are managed bilaterally or with groups of partners rather than through the EU. Bambos, Charalambos. Would the Minister agree with me that a clear commitment to stay within a customs union with the European Union would provide certainty to industry and investors that they will not be hit by the needless tariff barriers after Brexit? Yeah. Minister. Uh, I would say to the Honourable Gentleman that, that what we need is a strong relationship moving forward with the European Union to ensure that we have a frictionless as possible degree of trade with the European Union. So I don't think that uh, joining the, remaining within the Customs Union is a prerequisite for our successful defence industry. Morning, um, thank you, Mr Speaker. American-owned Darkem at Stillington is just one of the manufacturing firms in my constituency providing aerospace and other engineering products to the military, amongst others. They really do need certainty about future tariff-free trading with the EU. Will they get tariff-free trading with the EU? Yeah. Minister, well, the aim and the aspiration of this government is to ensure that there will be tariff-free trade with the EU. But I think that the company referred to by the honourable gentleman will also be very pleased to see a government who are proactively pushing forward the agenda in terms of combat air. I think we are world leaders when it comes to combat air. As I highlighted, 15% of every F-15 is manufactured here in the United Kingdom. We are leading on this issue, and the government is supporting industry in that leadership. Yes. Mr Speaker, the Government has often used EU rules as an excuse for not buying British steel for big defence yep. projects. Yep. Can the Secretary of State guarantee today that post-Brexit Royal Navy support ships and similar projects will use 100 per cent British steel? Yeah. Minister. Well, I wish I could offer that guarantee, but it's not possible to offer the guarantee that the Honourable Lady requests, because the steel required for parts of the ships that we are building are not currently, it's not currently available from the United Kingdom. The work that we're doing on the Type 26, for example, well over 50% of steel by value is from the United Kingdom, but I'm sure that the Honourable Lady would be the first to complain if we had defects in our capability as a result of buying incorrect steel. Stephen Kerr. Thank you, Mr Speaker. How are the preparations for the UK's alternative to the participation in Galileo going? Minister. I, I think this is a crucially important question because our, mem our involvement with Galileo is important not just for our own security but that for that of the European Union. We have also si committed significant funds to Galileo over the years and I think we have a, an obligation to our industry and to our defence capabilities to ensure that we do investigate th thoroughly the possibility of remaining within the Galileo uh, programme. However, there is work being undertaken as an alternative. If uh, Speaker, the UK defence industry was on show this week with Operation uh, Catamaran 18 of UK and French amphibious forces. Could the Minister confirm that HMS Albion and HMS Bulwark, our two great examples of UK military endeavour, will not be cut in the NDP programme that's coming up? Minister. Well, the, the Honourable Gentleman is well aware of the situation. As I uh, articulated in the Westminster Hall debates, uh, Albion and Bulwark are currently uh, expected to be within service until 2033 and 2034, respectively. Jeremy Quinn. Uh, thank you. Number 10, sir. E. Minister Bebb. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Our small businesses play a crucial role in our defence capability. To support them, we have launched a supplier portal which brings together a range of information and advice for new suppliers, and we have appointed a champion for smaller businesses to drive engagements. We also now require our larger suppliers to advertise their subcontract opportunities on government platforms. Quinn. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. Anti-drone technology produced by an SME in Horsham has been used very successfully by US forces on operations for over a year now. Uh, will the Minister assure uh, the House that the MOD will always go for best in class in procurement and is as open to smaller manufacturers as are our allies? 
Mr. Well, I think my other friend makes a, a really important point in terms of the importance of SMEs in terms of both innovation and capability. Our refreshed def- refresh defence industrial policy published last December highlights how we are encouraging competition within the defence sector, maximising opportunities for SMEs. And one example of what we have done, for example, is we have produced new fo- short form contracts, which makes it easier for SMEs to actually bid into MAD opportunities. Hello. Mr Speaker, but does the Minister recognise that SMEs depend on main contractors for enormous amounts of their work? And that's why his previous several replies on the fleet support ships have been so disappointing. Can he actually imagine our European G7 partners, let alone President Trump, buying Navy support ships from foreign yards? So when is he actually going to shake off Treasury dogma? Wake up to European reality by British ship, ships, building British shipyards by British workers, backing British engineering, large and small, and, and also backing British steel. Yeah. Minister Bebb. They, I, I, I listen very carefully to the right honourable gentleman, but I would not say, think that on trade policy we should take any lessons from Donald Trump. Yeah. And Dr Julian Lewis. Number 11, Mr Speaker. Secretary of State. I have regular discussions with the Chancellor. The modernising defence programme will ensure our armed forces have the right capabilities to address evolving threats. This Government is committed to spending at least 2% of GDP on defence, and the defence budget will rise at least 0.5% above inflation every year of this Parliament, taking it to almost £40 billion by 2021. Julian Lewis. I thank the Secretary of State for that helpful reply. And would he like to take this opportunity to endorse the suggestion by his immediate predecessor that we should be aiming for 2.5% of GDP on defence by the end of this Parliament. Does he agree that that would be a useful staging post on the road to the 3% that we really need? And finally, would it not be an excellent opportunity to take to announce any such advance at the forthcoming NATO summit? The Honourable General is going to give us his usual mantra, we need three to keep us free. (laughs) But it was incorporated in the gravamen of his question. Question. Secretary of State. I, I, I think he's saving that for the next questions, Mr. Speaker. Um, but um, what we need to be looking at is the threats that are starting to evolve uh, right across the world, including in Europe, and they are increasing very dramatically. And we have to ensure we have the right capabilities to meet those threats. That is why we're doing the modernising defence programme to look in detail how those threats are evolving. That's why we're leading that analysis in the Ministry of Defence, as against any other part of government. And we want to come up with the solutions and answers to make sure that Britain and our allies are defended to the very best of our capabilities. John Woodcock. Thank you, Mr Speaker. He knows it's not simply the amount of money, but when it is made available to key programmes. So it was great to to welcome him up to Barrow Shipyard a couple of weeks back. But does he accept that unless he can persuade the Treasury to release more of that, of that the Dreadnought programme, further forward at the crucial, in those crucial early years, we risk the programme being more expensive and potentially late, endangering yes, D. There is a very valuable point that has been made there, Mr Speaker, and actually making sure that we have the right resources at the right time to deliver on this critical programme is essential. That's why I was so pleased that we were able to secure an extra £800 million in this financial year to ensure that our nuclear deterrent is delivered on time and in budget. Kirsten Hare. Mr Speaker, as my right honourable friend would agree, we must adequately fund our armed forces to support those who selflessly selflessly put their lives on the line for our country, a concept the Scottish Government don't seem to understand. Can my right honourable friend update the House on the measures that the UK Government are taking to mitigate Nicola Sturgeon's Government's tax hike on those brave service personnel? Well, it is truly shocking to think that the Scottish National Party decided to put this extra taxation burden on our service personnel in Scotland, especially when we had asked them not to do so. And that is why we are proceeding with the review very rapidly, and we hope to be reporting to this House in the not-too-distant future on our findings. Chapman. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I, I am tempted. Um, but can the Minister not convince the Treasury that building the Royal Naval support ships in house at Lakes of Scythe would see a tax revenue gain for the Treasury and help retain the skills and the talents and the investment within our shipyards? Is that not what the shipbuilding strategy is all about, or is the, the Treasury incapable of playing a team game? You stay. Well, I thought for a moment that we were going to have an apology to the 70 per cent of service personnel that are having to pay extra taxes as a result of the NAT tax that his party has introduced. Uh, Mr Speaker, this Government is absolutely committed to shipbuilding. That is why we will be building eight eight Type 26 frigates in Glasgow. That is why we are having five offshore patrol vessels being built in Govan. This is something that I think the Honourable Gentleman should be welcoming. A recent profile by BuzzFeed has revealed that some colleagues have likened the Defence Secretary to Francis Urquhart, although they suggest that the fictional character may be a bit more sophisticated. (laughs) Mr Speaker, they might think that. I couldn't possibly comment. (laughs) With Ministers arguing in recent weeks that defence funding should rise north of 2.5%, can the Secretary of State tell us what sophisticated tactics he will be using to get the Chancellor to agree? Secretary of State. Well, as a Yorkshireman born and bred, we tend to be sort of quite blunt and plain speaking. Uh, So sophistication is not usually something that is attached to uh, to us. what we <laughs> well, well, they're different from West Yorkshire. Um, um, but, Mr. Speaker, uh, what we're looking at is we're taking the time to look at the threats. We're looking at the challenges that this nation faces. Over the last 10 years, we've seen the threat picture change so much, and it's not just something that we've noticed, but when you're sat with your NATO allies, we are all seeing exactly the same. The world is getting increasingly more dangerous, with state actors playing an ever greater role. It's right that we look at that closely, making sure that our armed forces have the equipment, have the resources that they need to defend this nation against those threats. Well, in January, the Minister for Defence People said that the cap on armed forces pay has been lifted and that we look forward to the recommendations that will be made in March. Given that it is now June and that this Government continues to be all words and no deeds, can the Secretary of State tell us when service personnel will receive the long overdue real terms pay rise that they deserve? Well, it was the Treasury that announced the changes in terms of public sector pay, but what we are working very closely with is the Armed Forces Pay Review Body uh, to get to a situation where we can make that announcement as swiftly as possible. Uh, Myself and my uh, my right honourable friend, the honourable member, the right honourable member for Bournemouth East, will be working very closely to ensure that that is done as swiftly as possible. Gavin Newland. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Number 12. State. I hold regular discussions with my colleagues on this topic. Europe's security is our security. We want to work closely with our European partners to keep our citizens safe and defend our shared interests and values, including through NATO and our future partnership with the European Union. Britain has been committed to European security long before the creation of the European Union and long before our membership of the European Union, and we will be committed to the security of a continental Europe long after we leave. Yeah, I thank the Secretary for the answer, um, I think. Um, but <laughs> what discussions has he had with the Scottish Government um, regarding the potential exclusion and uncertainty surrounding the future UK participation in the Galileo project? State. Well, um, what we are seeing with the Galileo project is, frankly, the European Union acting in a most unusual and strange way. Why on earth would they wish to exclude Great Britain from such an integral project for the security of a whole of the European Union and so many others? 
It is, as Britain is the largest spender on defence in the European Union currently, you would be thinking they would be welcoming us into that and hoping that we would continue to support it. But if they don't want us, we can do it independently. Uh, uh, Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. The UK Hydrographic is the only fundraising arm of the Ministry of Defence, Mr Speaker, and it makes most of the world's shipping charts. It's based in Taunton. Uh, The Ministry of Defence, I'm pleased to say, retained it and are now investing and helping support a state-of-the-art new facility. Isn't it exactly this kind of a defence asset that we should be building on as we leave the EU to increase our world prosperity and influence? Well, I know that the, my honourable friend fought a major fight to ensure that that investment came to her constituency and this important asset was preserved. And it gives a brilliant example of actually how the Ministry of Defence and our armed forces can play an important role, not just in terms of supporting defence, but actually creating prosperity and creating jobs. Mr Norris. Speaker. (coughs) With permission, Mr Speaker, I should like to answer questions 13 and 16 together. We remain committed to maintaining the overall size of the armed forces and we have a range of measures underway to improve recruitment and retention. The challenge is kept under constant review. Alex Norris. Uh, regarding Capita's performance with the recruitment target, the Secretary of State was very clear when he said, do you have to give them a red card at some point if they do not deliver? Yes, you do. Well, Capita aren't delivering, so when is it time for the red card? Yeah. There have certainly been challenges, particularly with the uh, introduction of defence recruiting system. However, 12,360 recruits did join the British Army last year. I have met the Chief Executive of Capita on several occasions. There is an improvement plan in place at the moment. I do think we need that to give that the opportunity to run through. But absolutely, alter- there is an alternative if need be. Martin Day. Martin Day. Thank you. Before the Scottish independence referendum, the UK Government promised to increase armed forces personnel from 11,000 to 12,500. Yet, as of October last year, there were less than 10,000 regular forces personnel stationed in Scotland. When is the UK Government going to keep this promise, or is this just another broken one? Minister, course, um, I understand the SNP's desire to get more service personnel in Scotland, because, of course, there is more service personnel they can tax under their NAT tax. Um, but I'm pleased to say that there's currently 14,000 regular and reserve personnel. Well, at least the honourable gentleman finds it amusing. Uh, but there's currently 14,000 regular and reserve personnel uh, in Scotland. And let's not forget that all of the Royal Navy submarines will be moving to Faz Lane, the new uh, Typhoon squadron in Lossiemouth, and our infantry brigade as well. Maggie through. Cadet detachments are an ideal training ground for those young people considering a future career in the armed forces. Can my honourable friend outline what he is doing to increase recruitment from cadet forces, and would he consider visiting my constituency for himself to see the hard work and dedication put in by cadets in Erewash? Well, we don't directly target uh, cadets for recruitment in the armed forces. However, it is a fact that nearly 18% um, of members of the armed forces were once a recruit, uh, were once a cadet, and 4% of cadets go on to join the armed forces. Yes. Uh, Neil Griffith. Uh, no, he's on uh, Mr. Speaker, potential recruits may well be concerned about the issue of legal claims against personnel and veterans, particularly in the light of the IHART debacle. It is now over a year since the Conservatives made a manifesto promise to tackle these claims, and the issue has been raised repeatedly by members on all sides of the House. So why has nothing been done? Well, actually, a lot has been done. I appreciate it is now some time since uh, that consultation was completed, uh, but I think it really is a reflection on the complexity of some of the legal issues, but I can assure the House that we will come back in due course. Thank you. Topical questions, Mr Barry Chairman. Question number one, Mr Speaker. Hey. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. I would like to start off by paying tribute to Air Chief Marshal Sir Stuart Peach, who fulfilled his last day in the role as a Chief of Defence Staff before moving on to the role as Chairman of the NATO Military Committee. Sir Stuart has served the Royal Air Force and his country for, so incredibly, for a long period and made such a difference to making sure that our armed forces have been properly represented. I am um, also incredibly proud to be able to announce the four new cutting-edge F-35s that arrived at RF Marham uh, just last week. Chairman. Mr Speaker, as a, yeah, a blunt-speaking Yorkshireman, as he just confessed, would he give me a straight answer? He must be reeling from the events at G7 in Canada. 
Are we prepared? Would this country be able to defend itself if America takes its bat home and leaves NATO? Is he talking to the French, the Germans about this? NATO. The United States' commitment to NATO is unequivocal. They are backing it up, not just with words, but also with deeds. And we should be incredibly proud of our long-term alliance with one of our very closest of friends and how important a role that they have played in ensuring the freedom of Europe over the last 70 years. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Armed Forces Day in Lowestoft is a very special event, though since the Shoreham Air tragedy it has not been possible to have air displays, which are very popular and bring much business to the town. Can the, can the Secretary of State encourage the Civil Aviation Authority to take a proportionate approach to regulation and insurers to charge reasonable premiums? Uh, the Shoreham disaster was an absolute tragedy, but we've got to move forward from that. And actually, just recently been just at the weekend at RAF Cosford and seeing the amazing air display that took place there. It shows us how this, these can inspire future generations to join the Royal Air Force and play a role in their country's defence. But I'll certainly take that up with the Civil Aviation Authority. Um, uh, Mr Speaker, the review of the Defence Fire and Rescue Service has been running in various forms for ten years now, with neither of the final two bidders having exactly a glowing past record. Does the Secretary of State share my concern that if this contract is outsourced and we see a repeat of the Carillion situation, the consequences could be disastrous? Minister, Mr. Rell. Mr Speaker, I agree with him that it has taken too long. I had a briefing on this uh, only last month, and we are going to make progress, but I heed exactly the concerns that he raises. Donnellan. The Tiffenham constituency in wider Wiltshire has a large population of military veterans who sometimes feel isolated and suffer from mental health problems. In addition to the recent and very welcomed announcements in this area, what more can the Department do to reassure my constituents? Minister Elwood. Mr Speaker, my honourable friend touches on such an important issue of looking after our veterans, particularly those who are homeless or who feel isolated. Uh, the Secretary of State has moved forward with a 24-7 helpline to support and also a new veteran strategy he has launched for, uh, which will be announced in November. But it is important that every local council looks after its own responsibility to have an armed forces champion in its council that looks after and identifies those people who are homeless and what help they can give. Jamie Birkins. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The Warrior Capability Sustainment Programme is incredibly important, not just for our army capability, but also for the UK defence industry. So when will we finally get to the production contract stage? Minister Bebb. The situations that we're currently at a demonstration phase, there are 11 currently being manufactured. Um, it's currently going through a trials programme, and we will report back when those trials have been completed. Leo Doherty. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The legal pursuit of our veterans and soldiers following combat operations is a national disgrace. And the Secretary of State will be aware that many members of this House support a statute of limitations yeah, to yeah, yeah. protect yeah. those who have served. So if a, if a legally viable route can be found towards such a statute, can the Secretary of State confirm that he will support it and he will legislate for it? I think that this whole House has a great duty to all of those people who have served our country, and that is people who have served in our armed forces, but also those who have supported our country in Afghanistan and so many other areas as well. Uh, I am certainly very keen to look at all options as to how best that we can actually protect those service personnel who have given so much in the service Alan Brown. of our country. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. Army numbers are at just over 77,000 rather than 82,000 promised in the 2015 Tory manifesto. Is this due to Tory incompetence or capital incompetence or a combination of both? Ah. Yeah, yeah. Mr Lancaster. It's an interesting fact. I think there's only been two years since the Second World War when actually the army has been fully manned. There are challenges, um, but I am confident that we maintain all of our operational commitments. The army is currently approximately 95% manned, which I think is pretty good, but I'm determined to get it up to 100%. Uh, Julia Lopez. Mr. Speaker, reports suggest China is fast developing a new generation of a military technology focusing on AI and autonomous weaponry but that will soon surpass the capability of the US. Can the Minister outline what planning is underway with allies to keep up with these advances? Um, 
what you're seeing is a number of state actors, not just Russia, but as the, my honourable friend outlines, also China, that are investing heavily in new technologies. It's absolutely right that we are also doing the same, investing in those new technologies, not only so that we can defeat what they have, but also to have the capabilities ourselves for our armed forces. Barry Glendon. Thank you, Mr Speaker. During a, re- a recent yeah. visit to Iraq, a delegation from the APPG on Kurdistan met with some British soldiers who trained thousands of Peshmerga, helping these brave allies who sacrificed and resisting ISIS enhances our safety and whose rights in a federal Iraq need international protection. Can the Minister confirm that his department will continue this vital mentoring mission? Minister Lancaster. Well, I'm delighted. I'm very grateful to the Honourable Lady who highlights just one of the many training missions which the British Army uh, and other services carry out around the world. Indeed, it's in excess of 20 countries where we are currently operating and providing this non-lethal training. Thank you, uh, Mr Speaker. I know the Secretary of State will share my hope for a successful summit between North Korea and the United States of America tomorrow that hopefully will reduce military tensions on the Korean Peninsula. Uh, What assessment has he made of the role UK armed forces could play in ensuring any deal is successfully implemented and enforced? Well, our armed forces have already been playing an important role in terms of ensuring that United Nations sanctions are properly upheld and the deployment of HMS Sutherland and uh, and HMS Albion have been part of ensuring that UN sanctions are upheld. But what we do want to see is we want a diplomatic solution and all of our work and all of our efforts have to go behind ensuring that diplomatic solution is found. West. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Is the Minister aware that all clean, most cleaners within Whitehall departments are now paid the London Thank living you. wage, and will he cut through the bureaucracy of the PFI and bring the Ministry of Defence into the modern times and pay cleaners the London living wage? Minister. Um, Mr Speaker, I would be delighted to speak further with the Honourable Lady on this matter and to see what more can be done. Mark Francois. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. I warmly endorse the Secretary of State's tribute to the Chief of Defence Staff, but Sir Stu Peach did say last week that he was deeply uncomfortable about the process of legacy investigations into veterans. I understand that several years ago the Ministry of Defence did a lot of detailed staff work into the practicability of a statute of limitations. Would the Secretary of State promise the House that he will ask to see that work and perhaps be able to take it forward? I can certainly make that commitment to my right honourable friend. Jeff Smith. Uh, Thank you, Mr Speaker. It's now 60 years since Operation Grapple. Isn't it time that we followed so many other countries and awarded our nuclear test veterans a medal? Uh, Minister Elwood. Mr Speaker, I'm well aware of the campaign, not just by the Honourable Gentleman, but by others as well. I'm certainly happy to look into more detail. He'll be aware that there are two components to this, risk and rigour, but also uh, over, uh, avoiding duplication of other medals already given. But I'm certainly to ha- uh, happy to discuss it with, further with him uh, outside the chamber. Mr Ross, deliver it as quickly as you raise your flag. Mr Douglas Ross. Mr State, please tell my constituents at RAF Lossy Mouth and King Lost Barracks when this UK government will mitigate against the SNP's NAP tax. Splendid. Six well, I, I'm certainly hoping to be able to report before the summer recess, and we are very conscious that so much investment that's gone into Lossy Mouth, we do not want people to be disincentivised from moving there as a result of the NAP tax that's been imposed upon them. Gary McCarthy. The UK Government has indicated that it wants to carry on playing a leading role in CSDP missions, such as Operation Atlanta, post-Brexit, but there are currently no arrangements for third parties to be involved in the decision-making. So how does the Secretary of State think we'll be able to continue this involvement while still having a say on whether to deploy our forces abroad? Well, the EU has made it clear that we are not allowed to lead any uh, operations after the 29th of March. However, we are continuing to uh, negotiate how we might be able to take part, for example, Op Sophia, Op Atlanta, or indeed Op Player in, in the Balkans. Mr. Peter Eaton Jones. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Minister will be aware that I and the North Devon community have lobbied hard over the future of Royal Marines Base Chivener. In light of media reports over the weekend, is he able to confirm whether a decision is indeed imminent? Minister. Minister. 
Well, Mr. Speaker, on the invitation of my honourable friend, I visited Chivna and was very impressed with what's happening there. No decision has been made on Chivna, so please ignore what reports you are being read in the media, and I'll be more than happy to discuss uh, where things are going with him outside the chamber. Cryer. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Can the Minister guarantee that by the end of this Parliament, further to an earlier question, the strength of the army will be in excess of 80,000? Yes. Uh, that is absolutely our ambition, yes. Mr. Philip Davis. Mr. Speaker, I asked every government department how many contractors they'd employed for over one year and five years, and how many they employed for over, uh, paid over £1,000 a day to. Can the Secretary of State explain why his was only one of two departments that either was unwilling or unable to answer that question? And can I urge him to go back and find out how many contractors are paid over £1,000 a day so he can, he can see and we can see how well his, he manages his department's spending? <laughs> well, you stay. I'd be more than delighted to make sure that my honourable friend gets that information. Thank you. Uh, Mr David Hanson. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, will the ministerial team recognise the work of service dogs in the Army, Air Force and Navy, and in particular welcome the establishment next week in this House of a memorial charity to be based in Delling constituency in North Wales to those animals? Yeah. Minister. The Honourable Gentleman, uh, right Honourable Gentleman, makes a very valuable point. All too often when we talk about our armed forces, we think purely of the humans. And of course, for many centuries, animals have made a fine contribution too. Uh, Dr Julian Lewis. If we cannot protect our service personnel from the Northern Ireland campaign by a statute of limitations coupled with a truth recovery process, who is going to be next? The Falkland Islands uh, veterans or even the last few from the Second World War? Secretary of State. Um, as I touched upon earlier, I think that it is clear that this House has a, a simple and clear view that we should always do everything we can do to protect those who have served our country, and we will look at all options to ensure that that is done going forward. Mr. Graham P. Jones. Mr. Speaker, did the Secretary of State write to the Prime Minister about further deployment of troops in Afghanistan? Minister. Secretary of State. Um, we always keep uh, our troop levels uh, under review right across the world, and this is something that we'll always do going forward. Uh, Mr. Robert Courts. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Progress on Rima site in Carston has been stalled for far too long. Would the Minister commit to working with me to provide the housing that the RAF in West Oxfordshire so badly need? Um, Mr. Speaker, Minister. my honourable friend raises an important point of making sure we have the correct accommodation. It's something that we touched on earlier. I know that there are some big questions as to what's happening in, in the Bryce Norton area. I'll, again, I'll be delighted to discuss th with this with him further. Uh, Mr. Douglas Jackman. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, in its most recent report the, uh, on the equipment plan, the National Audit Office said that the plan was not affordable, full stop. But the Secretary of State uh, has been given some recommendations, seven in number. Which one will have most impact? Minister. Once, once again, um, it's, fa it's fair to say that we do appreciate the work that was done on that report. We are taking the report seriously. It is being considered as part of a modernising defence programme. But we state again very clearly uh, some of the worst case scenarios are not recognised by the MOD as a likely outcome. Order. Time is against us, but my judgment is that proceedings would be incomplete and the House would be sorely deprived without an intervention from the Right Honourable Gentleman, the Member for South Holland and the Deepings, which I trust will be of its usual poetic quality. Mr John Hayes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mr Speaker, I was thinking exactly the same. <laughs> uh, the, the, uh, on behalf of the British nuclear test veterans, as their patron, I welcome the warm words of the Minister earlier. It is right that we remember those who gave so much finally. Nevertheless, I want a little more. I wonder if the Secretary of State will agree to meet me with those veterans to further the case that they should be awarded a medal. There are 1,500 of the 22,000 left. This generation, by recognising and rewarding those brave people, will do a service both to them, but frankly, also do something of which we can be proud. Secretary of State. I would be honoured to meet with my right honourable friend and those test veterans at uh, the earliest possible opportunity. Thank you. Order. 